Hello, and welcome to this film about indicator choices. Um, you'll have a much better feel for what's going on in this film if you've actually done a titration um, before now. So um, bear in mind some of the stuff that you've seen happening in titrations if you've done one. And um, what we'll hopefully try and do is we'll have a look at what a titration curve might look like. That's unlikely that you've drawn one of these while you've been doing a titration. Um, and we'll do that for different combinations of acids and base. And we'll also um, consider how you might use the identity of the salt that's present at equivalence to help you decide on what indicator to use. Okay, This isn't the only way of deciding, but it's um, an important way of doing it if you want to get kind of full marks for questions. Okay, So anyway, first of all, let's have a look at some titration curves. As I say, Normally, when you do a titration, you won't plot one of these curves. Um, but if we just take this first one as an example, strong acid, strong base, what this is showing us is if we start with a strong base in our flask and we add a strong acid to it, what will happen to the pH as we go along? Okay. Now, this vertical part of it that you can see, this is where we're going to see the color change in our indicator, hopefully. Okay. Um, because this is what is called the equivalence point. Okay, so this is where this is the point or the volume at which we've reached an equivalent amount of acid and base. In other words, if we're adding our acid to the base, we've added just enough acid to neutralize the base. Okay, this curve could equally well be going the other way. We could be starting with our strong acid, and it could be going like this if we're adding a strong base. And this is the volume at which we've added just enough strong base to neutralize the acid. Okay, um, It's not so important which way these curves go, Okay, because you can swap the acid and the base round. But what is important is the starting and finishing points of them. Okay, So if we look at our strong acid, strong base combination, we're adding the acid to the base. So we're starting at a very high pH, about 14, because we've got a strong base. Not a lot happens to the pH, as you can see, right, as we add the acid, until all of a sudden there's this sudden, very sudden drop at equivalence. And this is where we're neutralizing our base, okay? Or in other words, where our color change is happening if we're actually doing this titration when we've chosen the right indicator, okay? And then we're ending up at quite a low pH, close to 1 or 0, because we're using a strong acid for our titration, okay? Looking at this titration curve, this is what we might expect to see if we were adding a strong acid again, so we're very low pH, ending, ending up at a very low pH, but to a weak base this time, so our starting pH is not as high, it's about 9 or 10, okay, because we've got a weak base in our flask, right? And once again, pH doesn't change very much, sudden very sharp drop, and then down to this strong acid pH, okay? Another type of combination you might have, we've got the weak acid reacting with the strong base, still strong base in the flask at the start, so high, starting at pH is close to 14, okay, dropping very, very little until we get to this sudden change, right, and then a leveling off when we get to the weak acid pH, which is now about 4 or 5, okay. So three different kinds of titration curve there, depending on which acid and base we've used. Okay, And notice here, the weak acid, weak base titration curve, which is very rarely seen because we don't do titrations with weak acids and weak bases, precisely because we don't have this very vertical area of the graph. Right, The pH is sort of changing gradually all the way through the experiment. Right. So in other words, there isn't this, well, there is an equivalence point, but there isn't a sudden very sharp change in pH at equivalence. So remember, the equivalence point, right, the equivalence point is an important thing. It's this vertical section of the graph, right? It's the volume of, at which we are uh, seeing that the exact stoichiometric ratio of acid and base are present, okay? In other words, we've just neutralized the substance that was in the flask. Okay. Now, when you're actually doing a titration, it's very important that you go dropwise as you approach equivalence. Okay. Because you'll notice that what happens is if I kind of compare the pH here and the pH there, there's a very, very big change in pH. 
but I've hardly changed the volume at all. So what this is showing us is that we can go from, we can move a big distance on this graph, if you like, for a very small addition of acid or base, right? And similarly here, right? Adding just a single drop can take me from there to there, right? Or even a fraction of a drop, right? Because the difference in pH is huge, but the difference in volume is tiny, okay? So this is what you would see if you actually measured the pH whilst you're doing your titration. Normally you don't do this in a titration, you just stick an indicator in there, and hopefully if you've chosen the right indicator, it will show you when you've got the right volume to make this sudden change happen, okay? But it's important that you choose the right indicator. And there's thousands of indicators, well maybe not thousands, but there's, there's a large number of indicators that you could use. Here's a small selection of them. This is only a very, very small selection of all the indicators that we could possibly use. And here's two of the more commonly used ones, certainly in the waste course, okay? And what this chart is showing us is the end points of indicators, okay? Now, we've just talked about equivalence points in titrations. They're volumes, right? They're volumes at which um, we get the stoichiometric ratio of reactants in our flask, okay? Endpoints aren't volumes. Endpoints are pHs, okay? So here we can see the end point of methyl orange, right? Methyl orange is changing color between pH 3 and pH 5. So the end point of methyl orange is between 3 and 5. Okay? So it's where the color change is happening. And the end point of uh, methyl orange corresponds to a change from red in the acidic range to yellow in the basic range. Okay? We could equally well be from yellow in the basic range to red in the acidic range. But the point, uh, the point about methyl orange is that its end point is in the range pH 3 to pH 5, okay? Phenolphthalein has a very different endpoint, okay? It's changing color between pH 8 and 10, okay? And it's going from colorless in the acidic range to pink in the basic range. Now, it's not important that you remember all these endpoints, right? But it is good if you can remember the endpoints for methyl orange and phenolphthalein, okay? So about 3 to 5 for methyl orange and about 8 to 10. Remember, these are pHs at which the indicator changes color. Okay? Now, what has that got to do with our titration curve? Well, what we want is for the end point, so the pH at which the indicator changes color, to match equivalence. Right? And so we can see that at equivalence here, there's quite a wide range of pHs. So we've got a wide range of indicator choices. Here it's a bit narrower, and here it's narrow too. Here, there isn't really an equivalence. Well, there's an equivalence point, but there isn't. it's hard to define the pH at equivalence, exactly. Okay? Um, so, we are choosing an indicator to match the equivalence point. So, let's come up with some examples here, right? Let's think about methyl orange in this titration, right? Methyl orange, whose endpoint is about 3 to 5. Right? So it's going to change color in the range 3 to 5 pH. Okay? So in other words, I will, let's say I'm adding my acid to my base, as we are in this curve. I will miss the exact equivalence point if I use methyl orange. It will change color just after that. But bear in mind that the difference between here and here is like half a drop or less. So I'm not going to notice the difference, right? Methyl orange will effectively change color at equivalence, right? Because its endpoint matches the pH at equivalence. If we look at phenolphthalein in this titration, right? Its endpoint is about 8 to 10, and that matches the pH at equivalence. So I could use phenolphthalein for, or methyl orange for this titration, because both of their endpoints match the pH at equivalence, right? Let's have a look at this titration here. Strong acid, weak base. Remember, we could either be going that way or that way. It doesn't matter, right? Let's use phenolphthalein in this titration, and we can see that it's going to change color, roughly speaking, in this vertical range of the graph, okay? So in other words, its endpoint matches the pH at equivalence. Try using phenolphthalein, which changes color at about 8 to 10, right? And you can see that its endpoint doesn't match 
the pH at equivalence here. So this is going to be no good, this indicator. It's going to change color too early if I'm going this way, if I'm adding acid to the base. It's going to change color way too late if I'm adding base to my strong acid, right? So phenolphthalein, no good here. Methyl orange, good choice, right? Because the color change is happening in the vertical part of the graph, or in other words, the end point matches the pH at equivalence. Just to repeat, really, to get us in the habit of this, about pH 3 to 5, I've missed that slightly, I maybe be a little bit lower there, but you can see that the, P, the end point of the indicator does not match the pH at equivalence here. In fact, if I was adding my weak acid to my strong base, my indicator wouldn't change color until much too late. I'd have added a lot more acid than I needed to to exactly neutralize the base. Okay? If I'd used phenolphthalein, which changes at about 8 to 10, you can see that it will change color in this vertical region of the graph. Slightly too early for equivalence, but again, I'm not going to notice because I'm only able to control my additions of acid drops, really, from my burette. Okay? So, and a drop is going to take me right through this equivalence point. So the pH of phenolphthalein matches the pH equivalence here, or sorry, the endpoint of phenolphthalein matches the pH equivalence there, but the endpoint of methyl orange doesn't. And again, just to sort of emphasize this point, that even if we chose an indicator that had an endpoint exactly uh, equivalence in this titration, okay, there'd still be quite a large range of volumes that would bring about that color change, okay? So this is why it's very difficult to do a titration with a weak acid and a weak base, because it's hard to choose an indicator that will change color over a very, very narrow range of volumes. In other words, it's hard to choose an indicator whose endpoint matches equivalence. Okay. Now, explaining these indicator choices in a little bit more detail means writing hydrolysis equations for the salts. Okay, now we've practiced doing this in the hydrolysis of salts film, so I'm going to do this very, very quickly, really, but just going to get you to think about what salt is present at equivalence. Now, imagine strong acid, strong base. This might be, say, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, so maybe sodium chloride is present at equivalence. Remember, because there won't be any acid left and there won't be any base left. Right? So at this point here, we've just got sodium chloride and water. Right? So... I look at this and I go, right, can I write some hydrolysis equations for this salt reacting with water and so that I can predict what the pH of the solution will be at equivalence, right? Remembering that sodium and chloride ions are both neutral, we know that the pH uh, equivalence here is going to be neutral. So I want to choose an indicator whose endpoint matches that, okay? So in other words, as we've seen before, methyl orange and phenolphthalein are both great for this. If I use a weak base with a strong acid, let's say um, ammonia with my hydrochloric acid, then I'm going to make ammonium chloride as my salt. Okay? And you might remember that ammonium chloride, if it's in water, will react with the water because the ammonium ion is the conjugate acid of a weak base and so will produce some ammonia and will produce some H3O+. And this will make my solution acidic. So the pH at equivalence here is less than 7. So I want an indicator that changes color at less than 7. So methyl orange would be great, but phenolphthalein would be a poor choice. Okay, going on to a weak acid strong base combination, maybe sodium hydroxide and ethanoic acid, where I might get sodium ethanoate. Uh, equivalence, right? So in every case so far, I'm looking at what salt is present at equivalence, and I'm trying to write hydrolysis equations to demonstrate what the pH would be at equivalence so that I can justify my choice of indicator. Okay? So why is this going to have an acid, uh, sorry, a basic pH? Well, because the ethanoate ion is the conjugate base of a weak acid and will react with the water that is present at equivalence and it will form ethanoic acid, right, and hydroxide ions. And these hydroxide ions will make the solution alkaline or basic, right? So this explains why the pH equivalence is basic, 
okay, or greater than 7. And it also explains why you want an indicator that changes colour in the basic range, or something like phenolphthalein. Okay? Here, we've got this problem. Let's say we've got ammonium uh, ethanoate present because we've used ammonia and ethanoic acid. The trouble we've got here is that we've got two hydrolysis equations, one which produces acid, one which produces base, and it's hard to know which one produces more of which. Okay, so that's the difficulty with writing hydrolysis equations for this sort of titration curve. But the great thing is we don't have to worry about that titration curve because those titrations aren't done because there isn't a massive change in pH at equivalence. Okay, so that's about it for indicator choices. You can see that titration curves have quite a lot to do with it. And um, it would be good if you understand what's going on with these titration curves, but it would be even better if you can understand why there's certain salts present and how to write hydrolysis equations for those salts, which is something that hopefully you got good at when we did the hydrolysis of salts film. Anyway, as usual, any questions, post some comments, please. That would be great because then other people get to see the, the, uh, the answers to those questions. Or just come and find me and we can go through any difficulties that you're having. But please don't leave the problems until the last minute.